undoubtedly. <laughs> I guess I'll just jump in. Um, I'm. I would be interested in further discussion about uh, perhaps creating a regulation similar to um, Glendale's regulation that provides a bit more uh, structure to the makeup of the meet and confer committee, um, so that we can be sure that we have. Uh, not only effective representation from CEA, which we absolutely want to have at the table, but um, the option for additional um, teaching staff to be part of the, that committee and have uh, the same provisions <coughs> and uh, extensions granted to them in terms of um, being able to access those meetings that they're held during the contract a day uh, in terms of the district covering their sub costs and so on. So I'm quite happy with actually the, the entire regulation in terms of the way that it is in, in our materials. Um, or we can certainly create one from scratch using that as a template, but I like having a bit more structure um, to our, our materials and our process. Yeah, so I mean obviously we want to have a discussion about it. That's my personal opinion. Um, but if we you know, decide to go that way, I'd like to add it to a future agenda. And I think I have a yellow card. So I'll throw one out. <coughs> Bob's comments. Um, I agree that more structure would be beneficial, especially because there was some disagreement as to the interpretation of the policy this meeting and first session between administration and then the teachers and the staff on the committee. Two points um, of concern that I have. One are that it requires us to complete the process by May, I think it was May 1st. And that's a concern because the legislature has never done messing around with everything uh, by May 1st. So I don't, although we may want to do that in practice, I don't want to see that in policy that we have to do it by May 1st. I want to make sure that we have the flexibility. We want to wait until the legislature makes a budget so we know that, you know, we know what our budget looks like and we know whether we have money to you know, give raises or whatever we want to do is in there. And then the other thing I'd like to talk about is um, our scope of discussion is very narrow and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be so um, also a lot of the concerns that were brought up had to do with um, I can't think right now at this time of night um, workplace conditions and I wanted to know if you guys also thought that it should be brought into so that people can discuss their issues as opposed to just salary and benefits Well, it's my understanding that it has to be limited to salary and benefits. Um, so I guess it just it depends on, I, I don't know that you can reach beyond that, those areas, you know. But then I agree with you that some of it is vague here on our meet and confer. Um, but I don't know that, I don't know if workplace conditions fall within salary and benefits. No, from what I understood, um, was that between, so the, was it the case law had clarified that salary and benefits definitely can be discussed in the meet and confer process. They didn't, the, the other area was a gray area. And so some of the examples that we saw um, had varying degrees of how specific the meet and confer process and what the topics of discussion could be for. So my interpretation was that, um, we did have more flexibility than we originally thought. Is that what other people? That's not how I interpreted legal counsel's guidance. I, I think that where we might have some flexibility is if a, if a topic is generated through discussion at meet and confer and it is outside the scope of meet and confer, I certainly think that staff can bring that to us to 
the potential of creating an advisory committee to go into more details to discuss you know that in, in depth so as an example working conditions that are outside of the scope of meet and confer could be that I think the example that was provided was you know teacher retention clearly that I think is where some of that gray is there's retaining teachers is oftentimes a byproduct of salary <laughs> and working conditions um, but creating solutions and strategies to to address that is not within the scope of meet and confer um, so I think that that's where the, the balance is is being sure that we're addressing the meet and confer that which they're you know is appropriate topics but also having an avenue from that process to the board so that if we need to identify an advisory committee um, to engage in deeper discussion that we have that dialogue and that communication coming to us I almost feel like it may be, I don't know if it's a two-stage kind of thing, we often don't know until very late in, in recent years what our funding situation is going to be, but the working conditions, we don't, we, we know what those are in November and December and January, we don't have to wait until May 31st, uh, June whatever, June 30th, whenever the legislature decides to have a budget. So it seems to me that perhaps it's something where we look into working conditions and maybe it's not part of meet and confirm maybe it's a separate advisory committee but could that be something that we look at um you know, maybe january december january and then as meet and confer um happens um you, you know maybe that happens shortly thereafter so we're already starting to get the discussion going on some of those issues i, I think that the uh, our mean confer policy does allow us to talk about uh, I believe it is work uh, items that are non conditions of work that are non instructional in nature and district wide impact. So that was where the vague the, the, the difference in opinions came from. And, and that is vague. Um, I think vague can work to our benefit or it can work to our detriment. Um, I think we've maybe sometimes in this district interpreted things that are non-instructional in nature, perhaps, uh, you know, minutes of instruction, I can see how that is instructional in nature. Prep periods, um, it does not seem like that is, you could make an argument that that's instructional in nature, but it seems like something from my non-legal mind you could deal with and meet and confer. Um, but I think some, one of my concerns is that things have come out in the meeting and process that are maybe not a, uh, an official recommendation or not something that was a uh, within the scope of meet and confer, but it came up in the course of discussion and may have been mentioned to us that we should be paying attention to this particular issue and we have not always followed up as a board or as an administration um, on some of those issues. Um, something that was mentioned today, I think it just really briefly, um, I had asked about the school, the length of the school day, and somebody said, no, that can't be discussed. However, I thought work hours can be discussed. So if a teacher, teacher's salary and benefits, and you know, how long is her work day, his or her work day? Is it eight hours? Is it seven hours? You know what? So when it... And, Wouldn't um, the length of the school day have something to do with their work hours? I yes. mean, salary or benefits. Um, Wait a second. No, hours of work. I see what hours of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the length of the school day would have something to do with their work hours, unless they're not working the whole school day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I tend to think that the length of the school day would be part of this. Um, conversation if we're talking about their work hours. But I think what we have right now, we do have something that says hours of work certainly are within the scope of meet and confer. Um, it also talks about end conditions, that it's, it's separate after the comma, then end conditions of work that are not instructional in nature. So maybe it wouldn't meet that, but it would see, seem to meet hours of work. So it does seem like that could be something that could be in meet and confer if you, you take that legal argument but 
again, it's a policy that's vague, so I'm wondering if maybe what's before us is whether or not we want to clarify, seek to clarify that in terms of what the scope is. I well, just, and in the Phoenix Union uh, meet and confer policy, you know, it states that the superintendent shall have the responsibility of reporting to the governing board all tentative agreements reached by meet and confer deliberations, including salaries, wages, benefits, and other conditions of employment. So to me, that means that you can discuss, the discussion can be broader if she's supposed to report that out. I haven't seen, I'm trying to find if it outlines what else you can say. But I, I again, I don't, I would like clarification in writing from our attorney because I, I just, maybe, I, I, maybe I'm wrong and that's fine. But somehow I just, I walked away with a whole different view of what I said. So can, can we get that sent out to everybody? Uh, clarification on what specific? On what the scope of meeting convert can be. And we do know that several districts have um, reach an MOU with their employees. Um, I'm not entirely clear how that fits into meet and confer, but it is in the, um, the conditions of work are in the contractual agreement that are signed by, um, by employees. And I may or may not have mentioned, I asked for this from the Classroom Teachers Association of Phoenix Union, and what I received was 155 pages, and I have not read it. That's their contract. Is it really 155 pages? That's what an MOU gets you. Okay. So, and I would bet that probably many of, or most of their teachers have probably not read it, but um, I would be interested in what it does say. Um, I agree. Ms. Castine, was, did you, was it a very large packet that you signed? It being very large, but yeah. Okay, so it's like getting a mortgage. Um, yeah, and I think there's a balance between providing a bit more clarification in terms of what we expect our policy to do, which is fairly broad and short, and the other end of the spectrum, which is engaging in a whole different process for the district that some other school districts do, none of which are elementary school districts. So I think the balance is probably providing, um, you know, now that I think about it, regulations aren't adopted by the board so it's really just creating a structure that we provide in my mind equity and access to all interested parties to participate in the meet and confer process and to be sure that they understand what their roles and responsibilities are which I know staff does an amazing job during the orientation you know process in doing that um, I think to, to, to Matt's point when something comes out of meet and confer that isn't germane to their discussion I'd like to know really what our process is for making sure that if it's something that we need to address we're actually addressing it um, because you know I think that's our responsibility to the teachers and representatives in the room that bring up really important topics um, you know the example that I you know just remember off the top of my head was this idea of refugee newcomers Clearly that's outside the scope of meet and confer, but that has a huge impact on our students and our teachers and our schools. You know, we, to my knowledge, haven't had an update about that really formally or understand what direction of any of the district needs us to, to engage in a conversation regarding that. Um, I think that there's some potential impacts to the individual schools if we were to you know, particular, pick a particular site for all newcomers to, to come to and be enrolled in and so having a discussion about that I think is what our role as a board would be but it's certainly that that kind of conversation if you will um, and dialogue between the meet and comfort process and, and our work so I'm in favor of probably more regulation that just helps to describe a little bit more clearly and I think Lee, some written guidance from legal counsel will help us do that because you're right there's um, you know the gray is I think work hours could be, do you have to report an hour before school starts or stay an hour after school starts? And the instructional impact is there are a certain number of instructional minutes that each you know, school has to have based on the grade levels that they provide and, and that isn't a negotiable number of minutes. You can come, or can come and say, well, as an example, just using this you know, 
making it, uh, numbers off off the top of my head, but if we're supposed to have a thousand minutes a year, we could through meet and confer and negotiate, you know, 800 minutes of instruction because there are state statutes that regulate the number of instruction minutes. But above and beyond those, we can certainly say to our teachers, well, we expect you to be here a certain amount of minutes before school starts and stay a certain amount of minutes after school starts, which clearly impact the number of hours that they're working. So I think that's why it's a little gray, because there are some things that are instructional and some things that aren't. And depending on what the particular exact topic is, I think that's a, a case by case assessment. And if I'm misrepresenting any of what I know about me and confer it, Susan, please <laughs> jump up and say something, but. Uh, go ahead. Those, so those topics that, that you mentioned that come out of meet and confer that aren't necessarily in the current scope as outlined by our policy, from what I understand, it just it's on a case-by-case -case basis as to what happens and follows up. Like the newcomer program, there was already conversation occurring about um, what needed to happen, so that's been moving forward. But with the other topics, I don't necessarily know. So it, is it more of an informal um, kind of process as to what happens with those items that come out of the confer? <laughs> You're always last on the agenda. I know. You it used to be business care. services that got to be last. So, uh, <laughs> um, so as, as to your question, so specifically um, the example brought forth was uh, the newcomer's uh, question. And that, that's a perfect example of something that has an instructional impact and is not specifically within our scope of meet and confer. Yet we gave it time because it was important to discuss, and everybody um, felt like, you know, let's let's hear the story, let's talk about the interests on uh, moving forward with this. But we didn't make a recommendation per se about what the program should look like or where where we should do. It was really about let's explore and let's see. Um, and the the direction, if I remember the the language correctly, was for me to go to speak with Nora about is this something that's a possibility, and so that was done, and that even those conversations started way before the meet and confer process because we had um, two class a number of students a number of classrooms impacted but two ELD classrooms really impacted very very hard Mr. Donahue's and um, Ms. Um, Snowden's and so by looking at can we better meet the needs of those children by um, designing a program that went through the curriculum department. And I know Dr. Bogner is working closely with um, Nora and uh, Andy Gutierrez. So what we have done is looked at starting a pilot program, not a district-wide program, but let's see what that would look like. Let's study Alhambra has classrooms that are set up that way. So, th so there is progress moving forward. Did that answer your question? Well, with that item, yes, but with other items, are there like action plans or um, like how do we make sure that we're being responsive? Mm -hmm. So Those issues that come up. Yeah, a, a perfect, um, I think, a, a perfect example of that would be the retention committee. So the year prior, um, retention, and retention's been an, an issue in the, in the district for, for a number of years and wanting to retain our, our teachers who are so highly trained and um, highly qualified. So out of the meet and confer process, they said, well, let's, let's see if we could start a committee from there. And so then the governing board um, said, okay, let's do an advisory committee to give a heightened awareness to the uh, retention committee, and let's really make it an advisory committee to the governing board. So that, that would be something that I would say has a very formal follow-up. Um, I'm trying to think of some other issues that we brought to the table. Length of the school days on the August 3rd agenda for the board study session, that's another example. Um, the issue of what time has already been initiated in discussion <coughs> with the principals um, and looking at what uh, options exist. Um, just to address the issue of gray area, when you talk about length of the school day, um, 
depending on how you approach it, it is both an instructional issue and it is, as, at the same time, <clears throat> it's a working condition issue. And it depends on how you approach it and what you, what you come up with um, that determines what it is. So um, most of the time, things come out of meet and confer, they go to the appropriate department or the appropriate group to start working specifically on those issues. Um, that's what I know, that's what's been going on for most of the time that I've been here. And again, just because something isn't addressed in meet and confer doesn't mean that it can't be addressed. Uh, through its own proper channels, but I do think that does as a board to make sure that that happens. Um, I just want to stay in terms of looking at, and, and I haven't reviewed a lot of district policies, but looking at Glendale Elementary, uh, I like that they, well, they acknowledge right up front that Arizona is, it's a right to work state, and um, there are, is some legal opinion from the Attorney General um, implied that somewhat limits uh, statutorily that the, my understanding is the effect or the bindingness of, that's a word, of, uh, of the meet and confer process, but it really lays out that it is the intention of the board to engage in such a collaborative process. And I would like to see our policy reflect that as well, even though we're not required to enter into a meet and confer process that, uh, that we believe in interest-based negotiations. It's what we've we've done as a district, and I, I think I would like to see our policy more tightly reflect that. I think in any district too, you know, you just said the word collaboration, and collaboration is key, and and really making sure that all stakeholders are sitting at the table. Um, and so uh, I, I just got back from D.C. last week, and and that was one of the study sessions we had. The most successful districts had uh, the, the highest level of collaboration and buy-in from their teachers, um, as well as parents. You know, obviously parents uh, make a difference, and their students. So I think the more people we can get involved with the meet and confer process, the better. And I think that to foster that kind of collaborative effort, we, we do need to refine and clarify. Because I took away that it could only be about salary and benefits, but it says right here in ours that you can talk about hours of the day. So making that clear so that cl collaborative process is, is smoother, I think should really be the focus of what we're doing. And and we also, I'm sorry, but we also talked about um, it being, you know, during a school day where um, these are open meetings that if you're working during the day, you can't necessarily go. So I think we should also revisit the idea of, um, you know, making them on Saturdays, doing them on our half days, maybe in the evenings. I know it's a long process, but I think it's worth it. I like your idea of collaboration, that that word is thrown around a lot in our district, and I that has to, and there has to be room in a collaborative process to be able to say no or to disagree and not reach an agreement on something. And I don't know that everyone felt that that could be, that that was allowed in this last process, whether that was, you know, reality or not, but that was the sentiment from some people from what I understand. So maybe that's not a policy issue, but I think it's something we need to keep in mind as we're moving forward, especially if we're going to start involving other people in the collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not an action item tonight. It is for discussion and information. It is something we can revisit. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> it will be soon. <laughs> exactly. I have the other card. Um, yeah, I, I mean, especially want to talk about, I'm leery of using early release days that are designated for teacher learning um, and collaboration and working together uh, to focus on what our students need to fulfill this particular <coughs> role. And while I, I agree that we want to make sure that as many folks can come um, that are interested in learning. And we've been, we've engaged in a meet and confer process that is an open meeting and much more like an advisory committee, even though that's not a requirement, as I understand it. Um, you know, I'm far more in favor if we were to, you know, try to provide those kinds of directions to after school and or, you know, non-working hours. Because I don't want any teacher 
because let's be clear that usually the folks who volunteer for these kinds of you know duties and responsibilities whether they have leave or not from their classroom are the ones that are also volunteering for other duties and responsibilities most of the time uh, and so I don't want them to miss out on their learning opportunities because that's what the, those purposes of those early release days are and I would hate for any teacher to have to you know make a decision between their own learning and fulfilling you know a responsibility that they also feel passionate about so I think I'm more inclined to do something either keep it the way that we have and just provide release time for those teachers uh, and to the extent that we can maybe make it as conducive as we can to others to attend um, or doing it in the evenings or on the weekends. I don't know that anyone uh, responded to the, my concern about the May 1st timeline in our policy. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with when we need to issue contracts, right? I mean, right. I think that's probably the latest, unless Susan wants to tell us otherwise, that they, you know, can get it. I mean, if they came any later, they, the contracts issues would be a problem, right? Getting contracts back from teachers, knowing who we hired, and being able to effectively staff. So I don't know that we could do it any later than that, could we? Yeah, I would strongly recommend that we don't. Um, even the May 1st is, in my opinion, too late. Um, we... We always shoot to get contracts out by April 15th, even though that's not in statute anymore. Um, and then if there's, if, and we have language, you know, that if um, there's monies available, the, the meet and confer process will reconvene. <coughs> and, you know, then we can talk about do we need to reissue contracts or can we issue an addendum to the contract? But I think it, it would be in our best interest to get contracts out early so that we can project staffing and retention and, and all those things. I understand that. I just don't know that it has to be in policy because mm -hmm. the dozen or so different policies I read from across the state, none of them had a, a drop dead date for, for finishing the meet and confer process. Ours was the only one that I saw. So I find I just find that kind of odd, and I don't I don't know that we need to be that specific, and maybe leave room for flexibility in the future. I think that's that's, that's probably my perspective. So one idea, potentially one way of bringing this back, we can. Uh, uh, Ildi is adding it to an agenda item. Mm -hmm. Um, we could also do it as just a first and second read of a policy, and then we could bring up a suggested policy change, and this is just a thought, I'm open to the board's ideas on this, um, as you know, we have on the agenda before we leave tonight a second read of a policy. So similar to what we did at the last meeting, but it would be an opportunity for the board to say, no, we don't like this, we do like this, and that would then come back a second time for us to to have um, final input before it would be adopted. It'll be in, in your car, are you writing a specific way it's coming back to the board or uh, waiting for us? What I, well, what I've sort of drafted so far um, <laughs> is the policy and regulations discussion and possible action on board policies relating to meet and confer, um, and then the desired outcome uh, is to create policies and regulations that define and describe committee participation and certainly expand on that in terms of the role and responsibilities of the committee mm -hmm. so that, that we would expect to see some recommendate you know some recommendation in terms of language I think that okay. does that capture for you Hilda in terms of well could we possibly bring like the Glendale one you know specific, two as an example I e. Glendale and then we could then you know, either add or take off stuff. Because I think, you know, you mentioned the policy, you know, Ildi mentioned the regulation. So if we were to bring that one, you know, and then you guys can add or delete stuff from it. I think it helps for us to have a template. Yeah. To and so that from. kind of be, you know, we could bring that as a first reading. And, you know, when we, if that second reading we're not ready, you know, we can bring it back for a third reading. Right now, done that. Could we also maybe get a couple more um, elementary school districts that are similar to our district, just to kind of, you know, not to just look at just Glendale, but to look at maybe two or three more and kind of see if there's anything that they have on there that we would like to have as well, or, or that 
you know, just to give us ideas for that area if we got that too. You mean mm -hmm. email or something? Do you mean similar in terms of like demographics and makeup or the, yeah, the like way our policy is written? Or? I think more about like maybe the size of our district, the demographics, you know, urban as opposed to rural, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? So perhaps other Phoenix Union parts. Yeah, Phoenix Union requested Phoenix Union and so, so much yes, bigger than our district. So much bigger. So, Baltz, Wilson, Madison, those types yeah, of Yeah, yeah. Just have to be, have to be all of those. And just, so, okay, so then would we not be bringing it in as a first reading? You know, or you know, if you guys want to, it, or do we want to perhaps bring, uh, still bring Glendale Elementary as a first read, okay. but have those other ones as right. for our own for our own yeah, yeah. first read. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we can take the elements of those other policies and incorporate them. So does that does that provide enough direction? Excellent. My card is very well written, Hilda. Don't worry about it. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, we've already kind of looked at, you know, Madison. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, if there's no further discussion on this, uh, let's move on to 11B, which is uh, the discussion on the governing board meeting dates.